I'm John Robertson, Professor of uh, Media Politics at the University of the West of Scotland. Currently my research has been into the, the media coverage of the Scottish referendum debate, which is about power and the relationship between power and media. I started and I did a year-long study, quite intensive, um, the mainstream news every night for a whole year. I, I recorded everything, I transcribed anything relevant to, I thought relevant, to the, the issues of independence and the referendum. And at the end of that, in February of this year, and I published it and the BBC instantly complained about it. Uh, it went viral on the web um, and from Newsnet Scotland who published it and they had a 10,000 hits a day on it, which was massive attention for an academic to get. Um, but the mainstream media, who I had copied it to, the mainstream media, mainstream newspapers, television programmes, radio, um, ignored it. Um, and in particular the BBC uh, didn't ignore it, but although they wouldn't report on it, they, denied, they almost denied its existence, but they wrote and complained about it nevertheless. And they wrote to my principal as well, they copied him in, and they suggested that I had cast the university and the BBC into corporate disrepute. I did wonder about the narrowness of corporate disrepute, no mention of moral disrepute there. Um, so that went to my principal. Luckily, uh, my principal is a supporter of academic freedom and backed me up, as did other people in the school I work in. And uh, I responded to the BBC, I countered all their arguments, I thought, and then they backed off. And since then, they've gone entirely quiet about that. So what, what, what puzzles me is, given that potential to have a, a, a critique and to have a debate, why didn't the BBC report it? Why didn't the, the Guardian report it or, or the Herald? Or why didn't anybody report it and then, invite, and then find a professor who disagrees with me and call me in and have me debate it with them? Why did they just suppress it? You could have argued they were trying to um, endanger my, uh, my employment by doing so because they had never done that with any other research. Um, but the fact that it had cast doubt on their impartiality was clearly something they couldn't tolerate. The headline finding was an imbalance, a tendency for the coverage to report more on bad news for independence, worries about the economy, about NATO, about the EU and so on. Plans to halt EU expansion over the next five years announced by the new president of the European Commission have dealt a blow to an independent Scotland's membership. There was a tendency for them to be, those stories to be reported more than positive comments, which were often defensive comments made by, by SNP politicians. Now, the, the ratio was only about three to two, and I was quite surprised, as were many commentators, that it wasn't more so. And so what it showed was actually quite a subtle imbalance, not really that dramatic. But what was more important, I thought, was sequence. Let's get more now on that report that's come out today from the Institute of Fiscal Studies. And it warns that an independent Scotland would need to cut spending or increase taxes for its long-term finances to be sustainable. There was a tendency to start with bad news. And, and as we all know, people pay attention to what starts. And the person who then responds is put on the defensive. What do you make of this report? Because um, John Swinney, uh, the Scotland's finance minister, is saying that actually the whole point is that if there were an independent Scotland, there'd be an independent Scottish government making the right decisions on the economy. Uh, well, he would say that. So that negative news about Scotland's future after independence came first, and commonly a defensive comment came second. And the defensive comment is always weakened by coming second. Scotland, according to the IFS report today, and they're independent uh, of uh, either of the, the protagonists here, are saying that the problem we would face is that there is a gap between what we'd have to spend and what we're getting back in. Bad news. Bad news has been shown to be effective, and bad news about the economy has been shown to be effective. So I think we can say that when the BBC is reporting um, negative news about Scotland's economic future, that may be having an effect. It would be difficult to prove, but it may be having an effect. I think that's something to worry about genuinely. I think, I think the voters are actually quite resilient, maybe entrenched, 
I think it's very difficult to change a, a no voter from their opinion or a yes voter. Now, I know they're undecided, so that that's maybe the area we concern ourselves with. Um, what's more, I think, more effective is the subtle repetition, the repetition of bad news about the economy at more than one point in the programme. In the headline, in the main text, then at the end, and then repeated again several times throughout the day. I think that subtle repetition of negative information, especially if it's about the economy, must have some kind of effect. Difficult to prove, and its subtlety, of course, is one of the reasons that it continues, that people are not always aware of it. It's a significant blow to Scotland's Yes campaign. The Office for Budget Responsibility, the government's official independent forecaster, has revised down its expectations of the likely long-term revenues from North Sea oil. And not just marginally, by a quarter. I think the other major form of bias for me was the use of sources. This is the crucial journalistic choice, is what sources do you use? And there is a tendency increasingly, partly because journalists are so busy, there are fewer of them but more outlets, um, is a tendency to rely on establishment sources. Look, this is a, an independent report. The IFS is a very respected institution. Independence could leave Scotland facing starker economic choices than the rest of Britain in the long term, according to a leading think tank. A study for the Institute for Fiscal Studies found the decline in oil revenue would force Holyrood to decide whether to cut spending or raise tax. And there was a tendency to take, by reporting Scotland in particular, to take reports from the Treasury, from the Institute for Fiscal Studies, from the Office for Budget Responsibility, as if they were impartial. All three of these bodies are politicised thoroughly politicised and strongly identify with the, the unionist position. Um, so that, to my, to my mind, was a quite a worrying form of bias. And there were far more of those negative official sources than positive ones. My personal view of the, of the um, the issue that most people can, should concern themselves with, especially the undecided, but also all of the others, is that when the BBC or, or ITV present an expert, sometimes a professor, sometimes someone like, like me, so you, you know, I'm, I'm going to say here you can't trust professors, I think, but, but um, commonly professors uh, from universities um, and people from think tanks. Once North Sea tax revenues start to dwindle and the additional costs of things like long-term care funding come into play, then the Scotland, Scotland will have a bigger fiscal transition to make than the rest of the UK. These people are presented as if their intelligence makes them somehow above the dirt of the debate, that somehow they can be trusted. It's not true. We're all the same. Politicians, professors, chairmen of think tanks are all ideologically positioned. They're all coming from somewhere. I've admitted beforehand at the Scottish Parliament I'm coming from somewhere. I'm coming from a, um, a sort of left of centre position and I see Scottish independence as leading to, hopefully, a more self social democratic society. I admit to that. There's no point in denying where you come from. But a lot of the experts in television will be presented as if they're not coming from somewhere, as if they're somewhere, somehow parachuted straight in from a pure space where their argument is entirely reasonable. That's never the case. You can't trust anybody. It, and if they will reveal their politics, you might be able to trust them more because then you'll be able to say, ah, I know where that argument is coming from. You can weigh it up honestly. Damaging headlines for the First Minister. Alex Salmon's credibility is being called into question by opponents. They accuse him of misleading the public about whether an independent Scotland would remain in the EU. There was a tendency to, to constantly refer to um, yes campaign uh, ideas 
as being the ideas of just Alex Salmond. They would say Alex Salmond wants this, Alex Salmond wants this and so on. And I saw that as a process of demonising. Lots of people think the SNP leader Alex Salmond has a pretty big head, even if the 5-2 diet means the body's getting a bit smaller. Media who are part of the establishment will characterise opposition leaders as foolish in some way. They'll find a way to personalise the, the general argument and make it the argument of a single person and thus undermine, undermine it. I thought that was a major form of bias. Tonight, Alex Salmond under pressure over independence. Have you sought advice from your own Scottish law officers in this matter? We have, yes, uh, in terms of the debate and obviously... And what did they well, say? The First Minister denies opposition claims he lied in that BBC interview about legal advice over EU membership. The business of, of media effects is, is often coloured by people thinking about the Soviet Union, where, where propaganda was monolithic, where the, the state view was hammered into the, the audience. Now, it was totally ineffective. It, researchers now have been able to demonstrate that heavy propaganda is worse than no propaganda at all. Heavy propaganda, people start to realise, people start to uh, recognise that everything they're receiving is contrary to what the word Pravda means. It's not truth, it's complete lies. It's the lies of the, the elites in those countries. Now, people in, in totalitarian states like the Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, knew they were being lied to. In the West, in the democratic West, and I maybe should put inverted commas around the word democratic, but in the, the so-called democratic West, people often think they can trust the media. The media present themselves as sometimes independent, present themselves as free, they present themselves as democratic in lots of ways. But th that's, a, that's a, a message which is also a lie. The media is largely in the pockets of powerful people. We know that from case studies. We know that from examples like Rupert Murdoch or Conrad Black. We know that from uh, national broadcasters that they have to satisfy establishment positions. Now, a year or so ago, I had expected uh, a more fair, a more balanced approach by the BBC. I think I naively forgot it is the British Broadcasting Corporation. It is a British institution within a nation state which is changing. Inevitably with devolution, it's changing and moving away from the BBC. And the BBC is subject to, to tremendous complaint these days, although they won't actually tell you what those complaints are. When I was interviewed by the um, Education Committee at, at Holyrood, um, the BBC representatives were asked to say how many complaints they'd had about the coverage of the referendum, and they said they weren't counting them. And basically the reason you don't count complaints I think is because you've lost the will to count them because there are too many to possibly consider. Um, so I think the BBC remains important. I think it's damaged but probably not that much. It's the most important voice in Scotland.